a new company. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm just telling Drew, it's unconventional for Gary not to be here. And those who have been coming for years know he's almost always here. I figure he's got to be in mourning over the Apple Cup outcome, or I don't know what's part of explanation he's not here. But uh, that notwithstanding, let's go ahead here. Those on the outside who uh, who need CME credit, the uh, code word for this week, oh, here's Gary, I'm just giving you a hot time, Gary, Sorry. Uh, is wish list. Joan makes these up. She's, got, she's pretty creative. So wish list is the way you get CME credit if you're listening. So today um, is an update on bronchial thermoplasty. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. David Wilson, Medical Director of Intensive Care Services at the Lung Institute at Columbus Regional Hospital in Columbus, Indiana. And um, I don't know where Columbus, Indiana is. I just know Columbus, Ohio is sure people ask me all the time. Maybe you can tell us geographically where that is before you tell us geographically about the lung. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dr. Alton. Nice to have your audience this morning. Uh, marvel at the ability to do some CME that hooks everybody up at the same time, which is great for technology and the use of time. So Columbus, Indiana's distinction is about two things, really. Number one, a uh, Fortune 500 company in a medium-sized community is sort of a rarity, especially a really big one. So Cummins Diesel Engine Manufacturing Company, uh, heavy uh, lift truck products, international market, uh, very big company, I think 153 uh, on the Fortune list. But they have a benefactorial relationship with the community from a prior family that was very integral to the development of the corporation in the early 1900s, who fell in love with art and fine things, and we have a philharmonic, and we have a, uh, a separate orchestra, so we have two different uh, classical uh, organizations for a community of 40,000. But the big thing is they invested in uh, the city's uh, ability to attract and build public buildings with renowned ar architects. So if you go to architectural um, cities in the United States, you'll find Columbus, Indiana on the top five list or top ten list for the public investment in architecture. So that's Columbus, Indiana, and thank you for asking. So, we're here to talk about bronchial thermoplasty, and thermoplasty is the uh, technique introduced and approved by the FDA in early 2010. You have had speakers here before, as I understand it, for your journal club. I want to kind of run you through updates on data as about two years and a few months, two and a half years close, of commercial use has now ensued. So there's some follow-up data in terms of safety and efficacy that I think you'll find beneficial, and we'll go uh, if I get through this. The agenda for the morning is uh, to give you an overview and talk about certainly what the clinical need is in asthma. I think we all understand that there are uh, adult asthma patients that have chronic persistent severe disease in the NH LBI guidelines that have unmet clinical needs. Breakthrough symptoms that are substantial, systemic corticosteroid use that's considerable and potentially problematic in terms of their health care and long term consequences. So, those are the group of people that have been targeted for a newer technology or device technology to try and help improve their functional outcomes in addition to their ability to manage their asthma beyond maximal pharmacotherapy or immunomodulatory therapy. We'll talk about the procedure and how it works. We have a prop here to show in case you'd like to pass it around. And review of the clinical evidence to date and discuss and ask uh, questions regarding all of this. Disclaimer up front, there's a limited amount of clinical information in terms of the data that's available regarding really salient questions that a group uh, such as yours may have. So I'll attempt to answer those as well as I can, but there's not a lot of study of differences in treatment regarding cell populations. Uh, there's not a lot of study in differences in inflammatory mediators and pathways that are really relevant to current conversations about asthma and cluster formation. So that's a point I think we can have more of an open discussion about, but again, it lacks data. So an overview. The, uh, the product is very simple. It's a radio frequency generator. This radio frequency generator then uses a catheter through the bronchoscope 
to apply an energy at five millimeter increments of around 65 degrees centigrade in a 10, sec 10 second increment. The net effect is obliteration of airway smooth muscle, which is hyperplastic in the bronchial wall and asthma, as we all know. Uh, the scientific evidence is relatively uh, good in terms of efficacy. And the amount of unmet need in severe asthma is relatively small, but not inconsequential. So if you have 17.9 to 18 million adult asthmatics, and this has not been tested nor tried nor studied in pediatric populations less than 18, so it is an adult therapy at this point until that happens, roughly 5 to 10 percent meet the NHLBA guidelines for two severe exacerbations within the course of a year, which then qualify them to be chronic persistent severe asthma. Uh, a lot of negative impact in quality of life and a high cost environment. So in terms of changing, managing cost structures with asthma, the most expensive events are not pharmacotherapy or visits with you in the office. The most expensive events are visits to the emergency department or hospitalizations. So those sentinel events, for lack of a better way to describe uh, asthma uh, issues, are really where the costs lie. We're used to the stepwise algorithm, which you, I think, and I could all debate for a very long period of time about its validity in 2012. However, it is what we have. So working within that framework, the, the folks that really are probably most appropriate are the ones that are already maximally managed in terms of pharmacotherapy with high doses of inhaled steroids, long-acting bronchodilators, or beta-2 agonists, plus or minus the use of adjuvant therapies depending upon their immunologic profile with Zolaire or things of this nature. The real group I think you're looking to have an impact based on the data as you roll through it are the steroid dependents or the systemic steroid dependents that have breakthrough symptoms despite maximum therapy. So if they are on step five and step six algorithms for, for treatment and having breakthrough symptoms that impact the quality of their life are high uh, utilization of healthcare resources on a disruptive basis such as emergency room visits, loss of work time, uh, admission to hospital, those are people that are really appropriate to consider for this therapy. So this is a simple diagram. It's worth repeating the fact that the histopathology of asthma always has involved airway smooth muscle hyperplasia. And I don't know that anyone has a real notion for why that occurs in terms of fibroblastic uh, foci that may generate that. Um, the reality is that it's part and parcel of an acute asthma attack. The therapy employed for thermoplasty by heating the airway with radiofrequency ablation is really intended to deplete airway smooth muscle, and that's it. So a lot of the information in terms of safety comes from what's the effect on the mucosa, what's the long-term effect on airway uh, in terms of other functions, and there doesn't seem to be much now at five-year follow-up in most of the data sets as we move forward through them. So in the bronchospastic patient, the attack occurs not just due to mucus hypersecretion or airway edema, but also due to the active bronchoconstriction. And so it's this war, or thermal therapy, against airway smooth muscle that the therapy is intended to produce an effect by obliteration and have that be a long-lasting effect. Looking back at all of the busy slide, microscopic, but a, a common one we used in the past before we got into cluster analysis issues that may have more bearing on this uh, moving forward, but all common pathways still seem to end up in the same airway dynamics. So whether we go with uh, historic definitions of extrinsic or intrinsic asthma or mixed disease, the whole point of the slide is to make sure that we understand that we're still talking about airways that are edematous, that are twitchy, and that hypersecrete abnormal stick thick mucus. So thermoplasty, again, by way of uh, restating it, is just using radiofrequency ablation to generate heat and it has an ablative effect on airway smooth muscle. I don't know that I can argue the mechanism of action for that, but certainly it's been noted in canine and other animal models prior to being employed in human trials in the early 2000s. So the rationale was based on observation in non-human models that the application of heat to airway smooth muscle endobronchially, bronchoscopically, in a, uh, careful, titratable, direct vision, safe way, 
would hopefully improve or deplete airway smooth muscle, which has been shown histopathologically, and reduce the ability for bronchoconstriction and exacerbations of asthma and improve quality of life. So that's the premise for all of the preliminary data prior to FDA approval and since then. Journal of Applied Physiology 2004 article was pretty relevant in terms of bronchial biopsies done in patients treated uh, on a clinical trial basis with bronchial thermoplasty. So the histology of 12 weeks demonstrated epithelial layer had already returned to normal in mucosa, and histology of three years showed no evidence of any intraluminal scarring and appeared similar to earlier findings at the three-month interval. So it appears that the histology is durable over that interval, at least by conventional h and &E stains. Persistence and reduction of airway smooth muscle out to three years is also noticed histopathologically and correlated with reduction in airway hyperresponsiveness measured as bronchoprovocational testing in this study. So here are some of the uh, histopathologic slides. Um, from a different article, but quoting the same um, histopathology. And you can see on the left-hand side, a fairly abundant a layer and hypertrophy, airway smooth muscle, that's reduced to a negligible thin ribbon of airway smooth muscle on the right side, again, at 12 days post-treatment in this particular case. So does the epithelium get damaged and then regrows, but the muscle does not regrow? Is that the dynamic that's going on? That's the, uh, that's what appears to be the case in terms of the histopathology. Um, don't know that anybody has done any kind of shorter term studies to look at one day, two day, three day outside of canine models where that epithelial layer is a little edematous, but it doesn't appear to be damaged. So there's no study that I'm aware of in terms of either animal or human model that shows histopathology that shows actual damage to the mucosal surface. Remember, 65 degrees centigrade is about as hot as a cup of coffee that you had this morning. So it's not a tremendous thermal energy. I take it no one knows. You obviously have to destroy all the structure from the epithelium down to the smooth muscle. Mm -hmm. No one studied why the smooth muscle doesn't grow and the rest of it does. It just is. Okay. No one has ever uh, been able to show any, uh, any effect that would... Uh, be able to be studied. I mean, uh, I think all it is is observation of histopathology at this point. Is there theoretically a difference in frequency that the muscle would get ablated versus the other tissue? Has that been taken into account, or is it just straight microwave energy? Well, smooth muscle has long been known to be very heat sensitive, and that's from cardiovascular literature and a variety of other sources. So all of the catheter-based ablation of uh, you know, conduction pathways or um, muscle, cardiac muscle and things of that nature played into the rationale for why this might work. So uh, why it's more selective as a heat sensitive tissue, uh, I'm not certain that there's any explanation for beyond the historic experience from other areas of medicine. Yeah, I, I feel somewhat unsatisfied with some of these answers, but the reality is there's no data to, to, to answer those questions directly, but they're great questions. Well, you mentioned, I think, last night also that, that the reason that muscle's there is to allow us to cough. Right. Is that right? So if you impair that uh, mechanism, does, is there any long-term consequence on it? Well, I don't think um, depletion, you know, the physics of airway smooth muscle really allow for a narrower diameter for higher shearing forces of volume to be able to pass through a smaller tube and have better shearing for cough efficacy. So I don't think you'll obliterate cough, but you may reduce cough efficacy. Right. However, that's not been studied. Right. Right. So uh, it's an interesting question for FEV1s that are fixed in love from fixed obstruction, whether or not cough efficacy is reduced and would play into some of the, uh, the arguments that folks might make regarding bronchiectasis as a long-term sequela of the disease because of sequestration of mucus and so forth. Again, not really been shown clinically in any of these trials and long-term safety uh, follow-up. However, a theoretic concern, I think, that the whole community shares. The treatment method is very simple and it's worth reviewing. Uh, this is just by convention of design and from the brains of Dr. Cox at 
uh, McMaster came up with the idea that if something is going to be disruptive for a short period of time in terms of stirring up airway mucosal inflammation and possibly stirring up bronchospasm, we ought to try and be selective about how it's applied. Now, my own notion is that this will, uh, over time, decrease as technology iterates to lesser numbers of procedures. But that's not studied. So every provider doing this at this point is kind of sticking to the script. And the script is treating in three different intervals, right lower lobe, left lower lobe, and then both upper lobes at three separate bronchoscopies. Uh, the right middle lobe is left out by convention. That's only from the personal will of the investigators to understand that right middle lobe syndrome is a very common consequence from any inflammation due to the airway angle the right middle lobe takes with the truncus intermedius and just not wanting to invite problems with the smallest of all lobe structures that are in the lung. Mm -hmm. Only for that reason, not based on any science. So the pre-FDA approval clinical trials are worth reviewing because there's follow-up data from all of these regarding safety and efficacy that I think is more relevant and newer to you as a group. Going back through those trials, again, the feasibility study of only N equals 16 published in the Blue Journal, and then the uh, Asthma Intervention Research Study, or AIR trial, that began in mid-2003 and enrolled an N of 55 patients. No sham group. Uh, no control group beyond just historical controls and case legend. Then the research in severe asthma uh, study, which is really looking at an endpoint primarily of reduction of systemic corticosteroid use in a small in number. And the pivotal trial, which was sham controlled, which is Air, uh, Asthma Intervention Research 2, double blind and sham controlled. And just by way of review, uh, the bronchoscopists and the patients that were one-third randomized to sham, got three bronchoscopies with the catheter being deployed into the airway, into the lobe, and sequentially deployed at each treatment interval without any knowledge of whether they were actually getting the energy applied. Um, and again, I, a point that I'll reiterate from last night, but I've done many of these at this point, and you really cannot see a physical effect of the heat that's being applied by RFA. So occasionally you see a little bit of mucosal blanching, but the vast majority of the time you see nothing. So uh, I do believe that the sham group was truly about as sham as you can be. Let's go through some of the clinical endpoints and then dive into the details of the data behind all of this and where we stand now. All of these trials were set up to not look at physiologic endpoints such as FEV1 because it's a moving target in asthma and not really very valid compared to other airway disorders that have more of a linear relationship with severity like COPD. Quality of life scores are the main endpoint and major adverse consequences in terms of exacerbations, frequency of exacerbations, severity of exacerbations, and clinical consequences such as emergency room visits and hospitalization were the main endpoints. Oral steroid use was the one of the endpoints of the research and severe asthma trial on the right-hand side. There was no attempt to describe in a sequential or methodical manner in any of these trials the ability to understand with whether or not other agent class reductions occur. So uh, obliteration of the use of Zolaer or getting rid of or decreasing the use of uh, long-acting beta-2 agonist or inhaled steroids were not measured endpoints. Short-acting PR and beta-2 agonist were an endpoint based on the fact they're associated with exacerbations in terms of frequency of the use. So the AIR2 extension trial published in your journal uh, in April of 2011 looks at the proportion of patients that report severe exacerbations in the two-year follow-up. This allowed for sham patients to select to treatment if they were in the sham group to start with. So the end number of 166 is a little bit bigger than you would expect if it were the non-sham patients alone. And looked at, uh, it looked at other clinical endpoints in terms of efficacy and safety, but the main ones, of course, no deaths in the two-year two post-treatment, stable lung function in terms of spirometry, and absence of clinical complications. All of these were similar endpoints in the extension trials of air extension, which is now out five years, and the research in severe asthma, which is, again, out five years now in terms of clinical data. So air 2 is probably the best trial in terms of design 
and the most intense effort to try and really describe how the technology is effective. It's worth going into in greater detail. So the study population had to have severe persistent asthma based on NHLBI guidelines. They had to be symptomatic despite the use of high doses of inhaled steroids and a long-acting beta-2 agonist. In our practice, just based on some of the reimbursement thresholds that you face for new technology, we insist that they also have been on maximal pharmacotherapy to the degree that it's indicated with leukotriene modifiers as well as a really uh, reasonable evaluation of their allergic profile and good allergy therapy and or the inclusion of Zolair if appropriate in terms of the IgE level uh, and whether it's justifiable. That's not an inclusion criteria for AIR2. It's just part of the territory that comes these days in terms of reimbursement and ensuring you're complete. The AQLQ was the technology, or excuse me, the, the, the measured vehicle. Um, it has been done in asthma trials before where the St. George's uh, respiratory uh, scale has been used mostly in European trials, but that's much more common now in COPD and less so in asthma. So AQLQ was the tool. Again, sham control with two to one randomization for the bronchothermoplasty group. You got the same pharmacotherapy as the sham group, required to be on high dose inhaled steroids and long acting beta 2 agonist, and then got bronchoscopy with or without the delivery of radiofrequency ablation, depending upon randomization. 297 subjects, international study, 30 centers, most in the US, and one year follow up and then five year follow up, again published by Castro in the Annals of Allergy and Immunology in 2011 in terms of extension of those patients. In the Blue Journal, Castro published data in 2010 showing that bronchothermoplasty in the AIR-2 trial significantly improved follow-up at intervals of 6, 9, and 12 months for AQLQ scores across the treatment group compared to sham, statistically different. This procedure is known to have an adverse event that will happen pretty much in every case, and that is the known issue of temporary peritreatment bronchospasm. So by convention and design, everyone's pretreated for three days with 50 milligrams of methylprednisolone day of the procedure, additional 50 milligrams, and day following the procedure. That's the protocol in terms of how it's set up for AIR-2. Um, and that's how it's employed clinically right now in terms of the bronchothermoplasty programs. So you can see from the uh, treated group versus the sham group, there's an expected increase in the number of events related to um, respiratory-related procedures, in this case, hospitalization. Now, anecdotally, we haven't had to admit anyone, but I think every system has a different threshold for whatever their admission criteria might be. By convention, we will not let someone return home from the procedure for a drop in their FEV1 of over 20% from pre-procedure that day to post-procedure a couple hours afterwards. We haven't had to admit anyone out of the 25 patients we've treated. But there are various statistics uh, regarding that and various centers that do end up having some admissions overnight. The key, and I think the most compelling information is the substantial improvement in clinically relevant consequences, both in terms of quality of life for the patient and expensive care uh, events that reflect lack of control for the patient, such as ER visits reduced by 84% in the treatment group over sham, hospitalizations reduced by 73%, again, at one year follow-up interval, but extension data pending here in this slide set. Exacerbations are reduced, Unscheduled office visits are reduced, but the big clinical outcomes are substantial in terms of ER visits and hospitalizations. Lost from work or school, um, again, significant in the treated group in the Blue Journal. Let's extend and look at some of the other clinical outcomes that have been able to be called out of the earlier AIR trial. So the earlier AIR trial was able to look at mild exacerbations in terms of quality of life scores on a diary basis, as well as healthcare events in terms of change in therapy. So it could either have healthcare defined exacerbations or diary defined exacerbations based on the patient's own diary. 
and mild exacerbations were substantially reduced in the treated group. Pretty, pretty significantly reduced. Steroid use. The point of research in severe asthma is to look at that group of patients that is so plagued with symptoms that they incompletely wean from corticosteroids or manifest the need for systemic steroids on, a, on an ongoing basis. And the reduction doesn't achieve substantial clinical significance, but the end number is low. There's a trend towards improvement. Um, and I think that's all you can really say. Uh, anecdotally, a lot of us who have treated uh, patients on a commercial basis have this as an endpoint because the patient's motivated to have it as an endpoint and uh, have had good success at reduction or obliteration of systemic ther steroid mm -hmm. therapy. Well, excuse me, yes. have, have there been any cases of <laughs> church stress in the people that took or It's a good question. Taken off. And I think uh, the primary goal of making sure that you have the diagnosis correct is to is the chief reason for the pulmonologist to make sure that um, it's an accurate diagnosis first and foremost. So I think there probably have been uh, patients who have had uh, church strauss uncovered with respect to their deletion of therapy over time, but it's not reported in any way beyond just anecdotes. Changing quality of life scores in both AIR and RISA are pretty substantial. You can see that the quality of life score uh, graphics substantiate that, again, in the early follow-up data. So let's talk about extension data, things that might be new since you last heard a talk on this. Um, and this is the extension data of the principal authors, uh, Neil Thompson. And the data set looks at long-term five-year safety data in the air extension study. So again, these were not randomized patients, so there were no sham control. No deaths, uh, again, notable, but expected. Um, absence of clinical complications, and as you can see graphically, no reduction or loss of forced vital capacity or FEV1 or deterioration of pulmonary function in either the control or the thermoplastic. So there doesn't appear to be any adverse physiologic effect based on basic physiologic measures of airflow obstruction. But also no improvement in those. That's correct. That's correct. So is it? Um, is there a? Uh, I assume there's individuals that don't respond. Um, I, I think everybody in our practice has had some response, some much less than others. But yes, I, you know, there's a there's a scatter diagram. Uh, that's not in this uh, slide set that shows some outliers on both ends where there's tremendous responses and then some that are much lesser. It'd be nice to pull the outliers of non-responders from all the studies and see if there's anything in common. I mean, or is it is it phenotype independent that just sort of deaden the BHR? This is where this conversation I think has to go, and they're, they're good questions and they're questions I think all of us ask but haven't figured out a way to cull from the current data to answer, or needs further study and design to attempt to answer in terms of our evolving understanding of asthma phenotypes uh, in, in your literature and so forth. So I agree with you. Uh, responders and non-responders, it would be very nice to be able to predict ahead of time. I don't know that we have enough information to really even comment on that. But there are clearly people who do better than others. Dean, as you know, Sally Wenzel is coming next week. Yeah. And that's her entire talk, phenotypes and asthma. So you might save that question. Definitely. Yeah. And the answer probably is nobody knows. It's not enough data. But it's not like, uh, like if people, if you put them on 20 twice a day of prednisone for two weeks and see, okay, which ones actually improve further than their usual baseline, it, it, it doesn't sound like it, it necessarily matters um, if you're... I think that's right. Yeah. And, the critical question is, what's the testing methodology that identifies responders versus non-responders? Is it a histopathologic test of airways with muscle hyperplasia, or is that relevant? Are people who have more hyperplasia statistically more likely to respond to the therapy? You would think that's the case, but maybe not. So we really don't know. But there, there are really good reasons to ask and answer those questions, and we don't have those answers yet. Looking at the uh, research on severe asthma, and this is a small end number, so I, I take all of this as a caveat, but it's intended just to show safety as the only issue. 
And you see over time, even though the end is only 14, and there were drop-offs of two patients at year four and follow-up, that uh, as you go out five years on these patients, there's no degradation in FEV1. And the preservation of ER visit reduction appears to be stable over this small group. And hospitalization events also stable in terms of reduction over this small group. So no deaths, absence of complications, and no deterioration of pulmonary function is a reasonable uh, conclusion, although one to be taken somewhat cautiously given the small end number. AIR-2 has the best patient population and bears some further examination in terms of long-term persistence of the, of the treatment effect. To date, I'm not aware of a patient uh, in my colleagues that, that communicate about all this that's ever been retreated. In other words, if the treatment effect has been persistent enough, there's never been any kind of retreatment. I actually have one I consider retreating because uh, she had a good effect. However, it didn't achieve the endpoint she so sought after, and she was extremely edematous at the time of treatment, no matter when you looked in her airway. But I'm really not going to go out on a limb with that. I think there's a group of patients that may benefit from retreatment, but it's not been done. Um, Long-term persistence of the effect, however, if you look at both year one treated patients and year two follow-up patients uh, that did not include shams in year one, but include the ability from sham patients to, to cross over in year two, drop out, which is based on patient uh, not following through in terms of continuing inclusion in the extension study. So again, in the, in the Annals of Algae, uh, Castro's data from St. Louis University looks at uh, the persistence of the exacerbation reduction effect, which is robust at two years, and the emergency department visit reduction, which is again very robust, as well as the hospitalization. So the treatment effect found for the six, three, six, nine, and 12 month follow up periods appears to be persistent in this larger data set over the course of at least two years. Looking at long-term persistence of the effect over time in terms of the time to the first severe exacerbation, the treatment group for year two is the top line, the treatment group for year one, the second line, and the sham group is the green or bottom line. So the longer time to first exacerbation appears to be robust and extends into year two and actually may be slightly better, although it doesn't achieve statistical significance. So in just general observations, um, I think the, the, the people that are doing this procedure now still believe that it's well studied to the degree that we can answer some of the questions that we've just attempted to do so in severe persistent asthma. There's five-year follow-up CT data now in uh, Castro uh, group that look at the development of anatomic bronchiectasis and the fact that that doesn't happen it's from some of the AR2 patients. Um, again, we're interested in making sure the right people get the right procedure, and from our perspective, our first duty is to make sure they're well diagnosed and effectively treated before going down this road of an interventional therapy. It's an elective therapy. It really should only be done on an elective basis. You know you're going to have some effect of uh, causing bronchospasm, so you pre-treat and make sure you monitor them closely around the time that they have the procedure. There's really no question that um, it shouldn't be done at any point in time when a patient has active bronchospasm or infection. There's nothing magical about the interval between treatments or bronchoscopy in terms of effect. They can come back at a later point in time and have another treatment done once they feel better. A case study worth going through, uh, 54, this is our first patient, a uh, 54-year-old white female had asthma, uh, chronic persistence since her early 30s, and had really substantial degradation in her health from diabetes and other pharmacotherapy related problems from steroids. Sleep apnea, obesity, lots of weight gain over five to six years, admission to the hospital every other month, uh, six times in the last year calendar prior to treatment. I quote her IgE level as you know, less than 30 and didn't have any other opportunities for therapy beyond what she was already maximally managed with. Very motivated and got better on a serial basis with a subjective improvement that began to be felt after treatment number two, which would have been both lower levels and um, she's not had systemic steroids since therapy. This is out two uh, years, almost right at two years now. Has not been hospitalized in two years. Uh, 
not had any brain shooting in two years, tried to go off with all of the pharmacotherapy, had a cough, and ended up back on a low dose beta 2 agonist and healed steroid, and that's it, compared to all the other pharmacotherapy she had. I, I showed this last night, but I wanted to go back into it because it's very interesting, and I'm certain that the university has uh, this technology in use in their GI lab. In fact, I think I discussed it with my colleagues. But the future of um, interventional pulmonary medicine is a bright one. So we're talking about a procedure that's thermal, uh, with RFA being the generator of the thermal energy. But there will be a lot of other ablative therapies for tumors in the lung or airway procedures as we go into this pulmonary white space development in the course of the next five to 10 years, which is really rich with a lot of research and development right now. This is probe-based confocal laser in the microscopy of a carcinoid tumor in the left main stem bronchus in the lower right pane. Um, all the rest are really normal to slightly abnormal bronchial structures from sort of the world's smallest microscope of laser fiber placed through the bronchoscope to look at um, cellular macrocellular structures. It should be a pointer on the, you want to point out how it's just, on the uh, computer. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So, yes. Okay. So, the, the lamellar structures that are parallel are relatively normal bronchial mucosa. This is a person who has some edema around the area. So you see that through disruption of the bronchial mucosa with a more edematous area. This is 50 microns, so you can get the idea of the scale of this. Again, some more disrupted bronchial mucosa as you get closer to the actual tumor, and more and more disruption of the uh, linear lamellar type pattern with complete replacement as you get to the tumor itself. Novel technology has a great eye candy effect for pulmonary doctors and probably will have a lot of clinical utility in terms of uh, added uh, macro histopathologic inf uh, information without having to use biopsy. This technology is farthest in its advancement in pancreatic head tumors with ERCP. Uh, in terms of being able to have a predictive diagnosis that's pretty robust just with images and no biopsy. So we are very interactive with these patients and how we do it. Uh, we make sure that they're very followed very closely because it is a newer procedure and we want to be very responsible about how it's employed. And you know, typically it's done under moderate sedation, but I'll tell you that our experience as I end this portion of the conversation is really one where we've stepped up the sedation food chain, and I think that helps us have this be a, a briefer, less disruptive procedure. Conscious sedation, if you've seen it done in bronchoscopy, can be a very variable act. So patients can move depending on whether you're given a little bit or a lot of conscious sedation. Sometimes the catheter can have a little bit of mucosal trauma during movement or cough. We mitigate that all just by uh, using a heavier sedation approach, not general anesthetic, but deep sedation with airway protection, entitled CO2 monitoring, presence of an anesthesiologist to make sure it's done responsibly, and uh, find that the procedure is briefer, uh, less disrupted by cough, and uh, easier for the patient. That's our approach, and that's all the data that really is out there regarding this procedure. At this point, in terms of well-reviewed, information and, and trial. What questions or discussion points do we have? You, you answered my first one is what's the incidence of bronchiectasis after this, but when you use the CT scanner, do you ever look to see if you can show difference in airway caliber? Because that should give you another endpoint you could follow. That would be an endpoint you could follow, although realize this is a therapy for fifth to seventh order airway. So it's all direct vision. Uh, part of the safety of the procedure is you're treating major airway. Part of the potential problem in our heads is that you're treating major airways, which is, at least in theory, not the pathophysiologic uh, effect that we're, we're thinking is out there in terms of our current knowledge of asthma and smaller airways disease. So I think it's a well-taken point. That airway caliper has not been measured. Primarily, though, I think the argument against that would be to say from a pulmonologist standpoint, that's not the airways we're treating beyond the major airways, which you can actually directly measure, but it's not been done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so the data you showed um, you know, showed the decrease in ER visits and hospitalization with no change in FPV1. 
And they've shown that prior to treatment, those patients were having an actual documented decrease in FDV1 or peak flow at those ER visits, or has there been a data showing that patients after treatment are harder to provoke in terms of... Uh, Bronchoprovocational testing has only been done in very early trials related that I can share with you in that one data set uh, regarding um, induction of... Um, I have to go back to the slide. But it's only been done in that small group. Bronchial provocational testing has not been done. Biomarker, which we're currently doing a study with exonitric oxide in this population to see the changes in biomarkers, um, not been done. So FEV1, I think, was bantied about and argued endlessly as a valid criteria for study and basically taken off the list on a repeated basis simply because its variability in asthma is not a reliable thing. While there's fixed airway obstruction, the vast majority of patients with chronic persistent severe asthma are going to have periods of airflow obstruction that are minimal and periods that are substantial. And so it's a moving target. It's not a linear relationship like it is in COPD. And so the question would be, when they do have that substantial decrease in FPV1, if they show that you know, post-therapy that's less frequent or less severe? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Yes? Along those lines, is there a lower limit to, for safety reasons that you would submit to? Commonly to asked question. I get nervous if FEV1 is a 50% unpredicted and less because it falls into such a severe category. I wonder if we have the diagnosis correct, to be, free, to, to be frank, right up front, and don't have too much fixed obstruction that may not be reversible from other disorders that may be mixed in in terms of chronic bronchitis or emphysema or So, but having said that, People who did the best in, in all of these data sets were the lowest. So you would probably do it on someone who exacerbates frequently, but their baseline is 95%. Because I mean, that's, see that too, but it, it, some of that's uh, something else. This has to be sorted out carefully. We all, from seeing this disease daily, understand that the broad variety of symptoms come from a variety of places beyond bronchospasm. So functional wheezing, uh, reflux esophagitis this is not a procedure for that person. It's not going to do anything to treat their problem. Uh, it's not a procedure for someone who has unrealistic motivations, such as, I don't like taking medicines for asthma. Give me this thing, <laughs> so I don't want to take it. Yeah. It's not for that person. Yes, sir. You know, a pragmatic question, and probably the most uh, common one you get is, first of all, what is the cost, and then will insurance companies pay for it? Yeah. Well, it's a whole talk into itself, but you know, we have a ton of experience with that. I think the cost generally is about what one, one year Zola would cost. So the first year, so all the All three treatments together would, in our institution would cost essentially right around thirty-five to thirty-eight thousand dollars was what, what one year Zola cost. So Half of our people treated, we've had 25, 24. Uh, of the 24 we first did, we haven't finished the 25th. I have to go home and do that this week. Um, Half of them were on Zolaire. Um, of those 12 patients, six were very motivated based on cost exposure issues and co-pays for Zolaire to get off the drug and half quit it and had a persistence of a beneficial effect. So it seemed with now some five-year data and whatnot, it, with the exacerbation decrease and the uh, oral corticosteroid or the cumulative dose extrapolated for, forward, I mean, you could probably make a fairly a uh, nice cost effectiveness argument. And those are the arguments you make to medical directors, but realize reimbursement thresholds um, for new device is different than pharmacotherapy based on the lower threshold for device approval by the FDA. This is a war no matter what sector you're in. So in your neck of the woods, you probably some of you at least are motivated to look at exhaled nitric oxide. It's a cheap test. It's a reproducible test. It's been around since 2004. Karolinska has had data on you know, nitric oxide was molecule of the year in science, something I always aspired to be, but never was allowed to participate in for whatever reason. But um, <laughs> exhaled nitric oxide levels are in some patients, and we could have a long conversation, I'm sure you have here, about whether that's a valid biomarker or not a valid biomarker, but it has some clinical utility in some cases somewhere. 20 bucks, 25 bucks is the cost, somewhere in that range. CMS is paying it somewhere at 25 bucks, depending upon the payer, and there are vast swaths of the private insured community that deny it as experimental. 
eight years after the fact. So simple, easy, reproducible, not problematic test. So that's the world that medical device lives in, and reimbursement is a real threshold to overcome. Yes? Just a very pragmatic question again. How many times do you actually activate the device in those three to get a sense, I know you don't know how much of the percentage of airway smooth muscle is destroyed, but just technically, how many times do you set that thing off in three bronchoscopies? Um, uh, well, 50 to 70 actuations per load is a rough estimate. So, in the upper loads were a little less based on their decreased surface area. Uh, so, the, uh, both upper loads being treated usually ends up somewhere around 100 to 110 actuate, act, act, actuations. It depends a lot on airway anatomy. There's sort of big lungs and small lungs. Um, I know the device is sitting next to you there. Yeah, For those sorry. of us who are not uh, interventional pulmonologists, is there anything we would learn from looking at it? It's a pretty it? basic device, but yeah, I'll pass it around. Um, it has increments of five millimeters graded so the, the bronchoscopist can see directly that they're pulling back exactly that five millimeters. And then the four prongs, the outer edge of each prong has to complete the circuit. The patient's grounded with a pad onto their thigh. Uh, has to complete their radio frequency circuit for actuation of the device by having mucosal contact with the full prong. It'll warn you that you don't have contact and not fire if it doesn't have the contact. And so you can't over squeeze or you can't under squeeze. There's a whole squeezing science involved with this. Uh, there's anticipatory squeezing, there's over squeezing, under squeezing all of these terms that we've kind of made up and had fun with, but the reality is it's pretty technically easy to do. The main skill of the bronchoscopist is the knowledge of endobronchial anatomy. I'll just leave it at that. So it's easy to not <clears throat> repeat or miss. If you, are, it's, if you do meaningful bronchoscopy and have some ability to be uh, uh, doing advanced interventional skills in the airway, you can easily do this. It is the least invasive bronchoscopy I do. Of all the things that are out there in terms of new technologies, it's very, very uh, yes, I know you said that the most dangerous people are the ones with the lowest FEV1, but when you do your sectional staining to evaluate FEV2C, do they have a change in mucus secretion as well? Does the radio frequency ablate mucus secreting cells in addition to airway muscle? I don't know beyond anecdotes whether they decrease their amount of mucus secretion. They cough less and they have less mucus production anecdotally. It's not an endpoint of any study, and mucus secretion is not an endpoint of any study uh, piece of information. But it's a valid question. And again, a lot of these things have yet to be answered beyond our basic knowledge of just reducing airway smooth muscle. But the natural extension of this would be if you had somebody with chronic mucus production, bronchi bronchial obstruction with that, this would be an logical extension of this process into that group. If it had that direct effect beyond just reduction of airway smooth muscle, I believe it may. It's not been shown to my satisfaction that I would take it, take it off the shelf, for instance, and start using an allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis with mucoid impaction of the bronchus or something like that beyond the systemic steroids that those people are exposed to. I'm sort of thinking about this in the sinuses. If you could put this into a sinus ostia that was oh, all scarred down. There's no question that it would have other mucosal applications, just like it did in various other muscles with cardiovascular. Yes, For airway remodeling, the biofiberglass was the key cell there. Is in animal work, is there any data how the thermoregulation affects the biofiberglass? One of those no. helicopters you buy. Yeah. That's the best answer I can give you. There's no, there's not, it's not steady. It strikes me that whoever reviews things for procedures or technique is a very different threshold at the FDA than pharmacology to not know all these answers and approve this device, not to diminish the have nice data, but there are a lot of unknowns that you really want to know about. Well, FARMTK approval, the process for device approval at the FDA is a very low threshold. Um, you know, it takes about a billion dollars to get a pharmacologic agent approved by the FDA now. So the threshold's very high. So hence the difference in the payer community's attitude about new devices. That's like, I think they understand that, and they basically sit back and say, everything's experimental. Let's see what the claims show. Let's see if it's real. Let's see what the evolving information and the clamoring from the scientists and providers are about how efficacious it is over the years. And that's the attitude of payers, which results in a lot of this turmoil for new 
and a new procedure in terms of reimbursement. Thank you. I think that's our main question from the outside. 